Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the afternoon session. Thank you so much, Hank. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Vision and Justice. We're so happy that you're all here gathered today, and we're really delighted to continue the conversation. I wanted to begin um, with that monumental sculpture uh, that you're about to embark upon and this really monumental commission to shift the conversation, but to continue some of the themes that we've also heard about earlier today and yesterday, and to shift the conversation to think about two themes that I think run through your work quite heavily. One is the theme of humanity, and the other one is the theme of love. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> After seeing um, this morning's panel, I realized, yes, yeah, sometimes it's better to just be like, yes. yes. Um, I, I think a lot about how James Baldwin said that artists are the legislators of possibility and mm -hmm. uh, the parliamentarians of hope. Yes. Uh, I, I th and also the need for um, there to be a space for intimacy in public life. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the Astor spoke a lot about this morning, about the way, how do we reorganize and reconsider the way that we relate to public space mm -hmm. um, to allow us to think about the future and, and helping it become our, our better selves. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think the conversation about futurity is one that this work, The Embrace, evokes. And I love the way through some of the images that we've just seen of the, the, the bronze uh, a sculpture that's going to be erected on the Boston Common in the coming year, um, the way in which that work is one that embraces, pun intended, your own manner of working where you take iconic gestures, iconic gestures that we often see, for example, in iconic photographs. And you began um, with the medium of photography and then digitally manipulated photography. But I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit more about this, this monumental sculpture that you're about to embark upon and its relationship to the space where it will be and the history that it, it evokes. Sure, well, um, I don't think I need to tell people here that, um, but the Boston Common is the oldest, I think, public space, continuously used public space um, in the country. Mm -hmm. and. It is uh, for many reasons, and it's been, um, you know, Boston has been so central to so many moments in our country's history from uh, the, the Boston Tea Party um, on down through um, now I can, the segregation movement, but also thinking about, uh, more importantly, related to the MLK Memorial, where um, this is the place where Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King fell in love. Mm -hmm. And that she lived in proximity to that park and likely walked through that park. Mm -hmm. And to think about what it means for two people, young people studying to come together and build a relationship, to build a partnership, and um, the power of what it means to come together and to embrace someone. And the way in which that she um, held up, she helped, was, was the foundation of his his legacy in many ways and, and, and carried it on for uh, decades after he uh, was assassinated. And uh, ask it, And when we were kind of given this opportunity to make a proposal for us, we didn't want to make a memorial to just two people, a monument to two people. We wanted to actually in create a call to action in a way. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of a reflective uh, work that shows and embraces kind of both a reminder to everyone who's walking there and walks inside it, that they um, should think about the role of, of what it means to come together with someone. And, and if there's anything that impact that I would like to leave on the world, it's the impact that my grandmother um, kind of had left on me and my mom, which is the power of love mm -hmm. um, to overcome every obstacle. Right, right, and, that, and that's, it's so true in the way that you also offer in this new work, the, the possibility of seeing oneself and seeing oneself with others in, in the embrace, but also through the reflectiveness of the, of the sculpture itself. And so to be able to have something to you know, reflect upon, but also to see this beauty of humanity in, I think is one of the most powerful things that this new work is going to do for the Boston Common. 
I also like the way that it evokes, too, the history of African Americans, especially in, in Boston and in and around um, the area of the common. Of course, Coretta Scott King and Martin Luther King Jr., to whom the, 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 the monumental sculpture is devoted. But to think about a larger history of people in Boston from the past, from history, but also in the present day is something that this, this work will do for the city of Boston. So yeah. we're excited to see it. Me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I so, hate talking about work before it exists because it's like uh... yeah. Let's cross our fingers. Well, let's talk about something that does exist. So exactly one year ago today, um, the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama with uh, Brian Stevenson unveiled the Peace and Justice Memorial. This was uh, designed in partnership with Mass Design Group and also um, on the grounds of this amazing and, and beautiful and moving memorial, there's a work entitled Raise Up that you have there. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about the process of thinking and conceiving of how you would make a memorial sort of within a memorial um, and the memorial that is to peace and justice but that is very much reflective upon the legacy of slavery, the legacy of course of lynching and also the present day crisis of mass incarceration. Now, I was actually there about uh, three weeks ago with students from Spelman College, and we were moved to tears. Um, one of the things that, that we were thinking about was not only going to the museum, that, which is sort of the first stop on the tour, um, but reflecting on the kinds of information, the, the sort of bombardment of information about this problem um, that's, that is exhibited in the museum through historic photographs, narratives, objects, works of art, um, including your own, and then going to the space of the memorial itself and seeing how some of the statistics, especially those relating to lynching, are transformed into a space of reflection. Yeah, well, it's, I strongly believe that artists have a role to play in civic life and that we have um, not been filling our shoes as much as we could, should, and must in order to, to live in the kind of societies we want. And I also think that civic leaders should really think of themselves as creatives mm -hmm. because if they're always trying to solve problems the way that they always have, I think that's, you know, basically you wind up repeating history in far too many ways. And I really think of my work and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice as part of Brian Stevenson's artwork uh, to, because it is, you know, a monumental artwork, both right. the, 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 the memorial and the museum. And as a conceptual work of art to create and hold space for uh, a, uh, an element of uh, our country's legacy that has been far too uh, ignored and um, okay. not acknowledged. And, and then having this piece that bringing artists like myself and Sanford Biggers and Titus Kafar and, 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 and many others. Poets and, and like working Elizabeth Alexander, yeah. Mass design and, and uh, well, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, Ava DuVernay was there at the opening, mm -hmm. but, uh, and so Sarah was there, Darren was there, hi everybody else who was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you realize like this is an artwork, you know, yeah. that Brian is like, is, is, is an, an artist and he's trying to find new creative ways to address um, issues that, you know, academics have approached in various ways, artists have approached in various ways, um, politicians have, but also the, the need, and, I see, and, and Skip, you do it all the time with your documentaries and like telling history in a new way, and I, I'm incredibly inspired by that, and, and my in, interest in a lot of the work that I do as sculpture um, is, and photography, is looking at historical images as a way, and trying to bring history forward to not ask people to go back and look in books to do the research, but to put elements of historical record that are uh, overlooked into public space, into galleries and institutions so that people have to confront it and think about the present moment in the context of the past. Yeah, I, I think you do it so effectively, not only by looking to historic photographs, and we can, of course, talk about the way you grew up, you were in archives and museums, your mother, Dr. Deborah Willis, artist and historian of photography extraordinaire, uh, was at the Schomburg as the first head 
of photographs and you grew up in those archives. So you saw images and you've kind of called from many collections and histories relating to African American peoples in your work. And one of the things that is really transformative is how you began working primarily with photography and in two dimensions, um, and then transform these two dimensional images into something three dimensional. And not only just a three dimensional sculpture, but also monuments that are placed in public spaces. And I think it's really impactful, especially when we talk about civic engagement and also responsibility. And not only responsibility for, for historians and artists and cultural workers, but also responsibility for people who actually go to these monuments and experience them. And I'd love to know if you could say something about the, the experience of some of the spaces that your works have inhabited. So that if they're, uh, for example, in city squares, um, or if they're on lawns and greens in public spaces, the ways in which people have a kinesthetic experience by walking through and experience the, experiencing the monuments, I think reflects some of the passion of, of the work that you try to do. Yeah, um, what I have to acknowledge this image that's behind me yeah. in looking at this image of both propaganda to encourage quote unquote white women not to vote and to very much discourage uh, black men to vote, mm -hmm. not to vote. Um, and thinking about um, how public space and propaganda goes out into the world through advertising and, and, and magazines and various media that tell us who we are, what to think, and how we should navigate the world. Um, and um, I think my role is to remind others and myself mm -hmm. that I am whoever I think I am meaning that uh, I have, the, my potential is only limited by my own creative capacity to um, bring what I want to imagine into the world. And a as a result of that, I start to think that I, something that I really hold true is that I am you, uh, something that Gordon Parks has said, mm -hmm. that I am I'm each and every one of you, mm -hmm. and that through collaboration, I can get to touch as much as I possibly can and be everywhere that I possibly can. So I've been able to, through my collaborative projects, be exhibited in airports, at, um, at, in, in uh, museums, uh, outside of museums, and in public sculpture parks, in uh, all around in five or six or seven different countries, and, yeah. and f now uh, with Four Freedoms in all 50 states plus DC and Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And I, my ego isn't attached to my name, my ego is attached to my love. So if I can love you and you do something, I'm like, yes, yes. I just did it. You know, yeah. and, and so I, I have a real uh, um, a, a joy in, in being a part of, a small part of, of, of a community of people who are, are changing the world. And that's what I saw when I was watching the slides this morning. And, I was like, oh, we're all here working together. Yeah. Like, I don't think about myself, even though I've been friends with the Aster for almost 15 years, we've never made art together. Right. But then I was like, wait, I guess we are working together. Yeah. And, 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 and thinking about um, this collective work that we do, uh, I, yeah, I, I feel that I am large and I yeah. contain multitudes, as a, a, a great American once said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm speaking about collaboration. It, it seems to me, just after having written about your work and knowing you for much, well, much of my life too, I, I would say that this need to collaborate is, is really part of your, your working method. And just when you finished graduate school, you and other artists formed Cause Collective. And Cause Collective is one of the collaboratives that Hank is very actively involved in that has, as you said, mounted exhibitions in airports along the way. Afghanistan. In Af Afghanistan. The Truth Booth has been um, all over, just about all over the world. At least that's the intention of it. Um, and then Four Freedoms. I kind of wanted to come back to that project too, just to get you to talk a little bit about it because it was a really prescient idea uh, that you and Eric Gottesman um, started this, 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 this this, um, you started Four Freedoms at a time in, uh, that 
that in the country here we were dealing with the, you know, the, the midterm elections, right? And you wanted to address that um, with art and you wanted to address that in, in a way that would make people think about what it means to participate um, in a civic society, what it means to have your vote counted, what it means to be able to have your say. And so I'd like for you to talk about the program, but also the references that you're making to um, in the title of the work. Yeah, well, the Four Freedoms 50 State Initiative. Uh, but actually, Four Freedoms started um, at a conference that my mother, Deborah Willis, and Ellen Toscano did, um, Black Portraitures 3, 2, at, uh, yeah. uh, in collaboration with Skip uh, and the, 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 the Boys Institute uh, at, uh, at, at, Har at, at NYU in, in Florence, Italy. Yeah. And er there were, it was a convening much like this, uh, so I can imagine great things being born out of this collaboration. And Eric and I were walking from one convening to the, one session to the next, and we're talking, is June, May 2, 2015, and we were talking about the election season and uh, what we thought might happen so our president wasn't even running at the time. And we realized that um, every election, him and I tended to only speak around election talk season, and we were saying, oh, so-and-so should do this, so-and-so should be doing that. And we realized that at some, some point we need to put some, our skin in the game and that by the inspiration of all the creative people we were around that we actually should take the ideas that we have in these conferences and these convenings and put them out into the world. And so we um, were very much looking at a, 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 an artist's work that was put out into the world as kind of a way to tell stories um, for uh, patriotism, which was uh, Norman Rockwell's F-O-U-R Freedoms paintings, mm -hmm. which were a representation of um, FDR's Four Freedoms, which were freedom of speech, freedom of, from want, freedom of worship and freedom from fear, um, which he, he spoke about in his 1941 State of the Union speech, um, and saying that everyone was in, in the world was entitled to these four basic freedoms that we should be willing to fight for. And Rockwell made these paintings that showed um, what these human rights values were and how um, they were worth fighting for. And they were used to raise hundreds of millions, hundreds of, millions of dollars for the war effort uh, by the United States government. And we uh, thought that we needed to be involved in that kind of propaganda making. So we started uh, an organization, FOURfreedoms.com was taken. So we thought, uh, Eric realized that FOURfreedoms.com wasn't taken. Mm -hmm. uh, and we decided that, you know, we're for freedoms because if we wanted to actually be thinking forward, we had to be for freedoms that we, at this point in our lives, may not be willing to uh, embrace or even consider. And uh, we started off as a super PAC, and we uh, decided that we were going to be putting uh, critical discourse into political discourse through fine art thinking and asking artists uh, from all over the country and in the various parts of the world to create um, billboards with us that we eventually, in the 50 State Initiative, put up in all 50 states plus DC and Puerto Rico. I think Bayate Ross Smith and, uh, and, uh, and Theaster, who, was, who were also here, uh, did, did billboards with us. Um, and then we did, so we wanted to do over 200 billboards. Wow. Um, in the past few years, we've done over 100 exhibitions with artists in, from over 250 institutions all over the country and uh, did over 100 uh, town halls, which were convenings um, in the spirit of this, but not as awesome, <laughs> um, that really are centered around artist practices as a form, uh, as inspiration for civic discourse. So thinking about mass incarceration with artists who have been incarcerated, um, who are challenging what that, you know, what, uh, how we should be affecting the criminal justice system, but as well as with politicians who are also invested. Um, there's various projects that we've done. It's fantastic, and it also kind of makes me think back to one of your starting points. If we were to look at, say, the work that you did when you were in graduate school, and the theme that runs through your work, this image, I am a man, and this work here that kind of comes from that iconic Ernest Withers photograph, a lot of the work and a lot of the, the ideas that you have espoused in your public work and also in your um, 2D work has had a lot to do with the ways in which black men are represented in the media um, and in photography. 
And I wanted to ask if you could talk about some of those initial works that you did um, for your thesis show and the way that you, you kind of seamlessly um, put together images that were photographically manipulated and placed them in advertising kiosks and many people thought that they were real ads and how that transformed your working methodology going forward. Yeah, and that also started with Eric as well. We were, um, I was uh, making images that looked like Nike ads, but Nike would probably never make those images. <laughs> um, and wanted to really find a way, and MasterCard, Absolute, et cetera, but wanted to find a way, and here are the Four Freedoms paintings behind me. Um, and then this is the original five of us who started uh, yeah. Four Freedoms. Um, acting as political operatives in this performance. Because, <laughs> um, you know, you've got to believe that your own hype. Right, um, right. But I put these billboards, I put these at, in the MFA show because I'm a master cr procrastinator. Uh, every space in the whole exhibition was already gone. <laughs> so I was like, it's fine, I'll find something to do. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about maybe I'll get like a bus stop or something. Mm -hmm. So I went to this, um, uh, Viacom Outdoor at the time and said, um, can I rent a bus stop? And they were like, it's $2,000 a day. And I was like, uh, I can't do that. And then I saw these kiosks that they have on Market Street in San Francisco. And I was like, uh, how about those? And the guy said, they're $500 a day. And the show was 10 days. I was like, I don't have that kind of money. I was like, how about $500 for uh, 10 days? <laughs> and he's like, okay. And <laughs> Somehow it took, like, they it took a crane. It was like the three ton, like, you know, 12 or 15 foot sign. And they plopped it out in the courtyard in front of the school. And I remember watching people walk into the building and be like, this school is just getting so corporate. I can't believe Nike and Absolute are sponsoring the MFA show. Um, and, and I realized that somehow by just using that language of their branding language that I could add things into that language that they would have never intended. Because mm -hmm. there is something with, with our president's name means when, right. you know, and you can't, and there was like for 30 years or 40 years, you saw a, a, a shiny golden sign that said Trump. Mm -hmm. um, the, the power of branding is so epic. Mm -hmm. And our willingness, our not, it's usually a one-way conversation telling us what to buy, but I think now we need to kind of adapt that ubiquitous language because you don't even have to speak a language to interpret the advertisements. Right. So how do we start to use branding as this new global language to tell different stories? And that's what kind of birthed a lot of the, the methodologies that we've been doing with Four Freedoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, using branding to, branding and cross-branding even to, to be able to speak out and to, to, uh, to transform the civic society that we want to, to live in. Um, I wanted to ask you to talk about um, a work that I really love um, that has the word love in it. Many of your works have the word love in them. And um, this is a sculpture um, that was installed in 2017 in San Francisco called Love Over Rules. And I'd like for you to talk about that one and tell us about this sculpture, which is one that is um, illuminated at night. Um, these are just the letters, if you will, in fluorescence, illuminated at night, love over rules. What does it mean and why is it there? Why is it such an important site for the, the placement of that work? Yeah, um, well, and I see you're wearing an I Am Human shirt. I've never seen one of those person. Um, um, I, made, I designed that shirt for a documentary on Maya Angelou and I'd never seen it in person, so that's cool. <laughs> Uh, thank you. All right. Um, and um, everything that I can try, and you're walking around wearing a shirt that says I'm human. Often when I introduce myself to people, I, they say like, you know, uh, I say I, I'm a person. And often people giggle. Um, and I realize, because you know, that we give ourselves title, titles and labels um, that validate us. But especially as an African-American man, I think if there's anything I want someone to know about me um, from the second I get to speak, it's that I'm a person, that I am a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, because all too often our humanity is not recognized. Right. And I feel like I have this responsibility um, to remind myself of that because people are, are, are fragile. Mm -hmm. um, but among other things, um, 
but also to remind everyone else of that. And this need to have intimacy is something that drives a lot of what I want to do because I think when you have intimacy with someone, it's so much harder to harm them, um, at least willfully, um, often. <laughs> uh, and uh, my cousin, Sunga Willis, uh, was murdered. Um, and he was, he was shot at gunpoint during a robbery. Someone was robbing him. And um, he was 27 years old. We lived together. Our last argument, because he was my like, he was my life plan. I was just like, I'm just gonna sit behind him and I'll be fine. Um, and um, soon after he was murdered, our, so our last argument was about, I was gonna go to San Francisco to grad school. He'd always wanna move to San Francisco. He's like, man, you always follow me. I was like, no, I'm gonna go to school, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and literally two days later, he was murdered. And I wound up moving to San Francisco with, out the, you know, my plan really was to follow him, but I didn't wanna admit it. Um, and I found, and so I had this, all of a sudden this, uh, I was at a loss about like, who am I, what am I, and then recognizing how often, you know, African American men, uh, young men especially, because we were like bragging that we turned 21 without getting uh, shot. Um, and recognizing how many of us fall victim to mm -hmm. violence, um, not only from police violence, but also because of a sense of not valuing ourselves and each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and I found some random recording of my cousin, like on a disc that someone had, and it was the last, he was like, oh, me and my, your cousin, we were like messing around on a microphone, uh, you know, right before he died. And the last words on his, that he said on this recording were love over rules. Um, and it just, it, you know, to me this like, it was, uh, I, I felt like it was a message, not only to me, but to the world that yeah. I wanted to so put out. And it, it wasn't clear if it was love over rules or love over rules. Mm -hmm. um, because I think he always felt frustrated with the idea, the rules, as a black man, he was an athlete, he had to play sports, but he didn't like playing sports. Mm -hmm. But he got to go to college through playing sports. And, and a lot of the roles that he had to play in society, he felt like he needed to do that in order to be loved. Um, and, and so for me, I think a lot of what I, I wanted to do with that piece, which was put in San Francisco, where we were arguing about on, on a building um, that um, I think is, it's really a monument to my cousin. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's such a powerful monument, but also so simple. The way that you use words is something that really impresses me. And I'd love it if you could say something more about that, perhaps referring to the work that just flashed a little while ago, I Am a Man, the way that you use titles and, and try to kind of think about different ways that certain titles That's Zoe might mean for poor freedoms. Might mean things, yeah, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, words are, are, are um, uh, there's an artist actually who did a Four Freedoms billboard that you'll see maybe um, named Christine Sun Kim. And it says, words shape reality. Mm -hmm. uh, the words that we choose do really create the pictures in our mind to create the world that exists. And sometimes we don't have words to describe things. Uh, we, have to, we have to make them. Uh, but also, there are subtle shifts in words, like all lives matter is, was, a, was a response to, to black lives matters, as if black lives weren't part of all lives. And uh, I, I uh, wanted to put out all lives matter because a lot of times people who were saying all lives matter meant all lives matter, but some more than others. Right. And so there's like, there's an inherent uh, kind of message, mixed message or hidden message in there. And so uh, what we, are, we hope to do, so this is the 50 state initiative that uh, you see some of the uh, younger people on our team are putting up the maps of where, we, where we did, we're doing projects. We really do think that we need to have a much more complicated critical public discourse, that you don't just see something and have a knee-jerk response of anger or joy, or, uh, but to really, what good, good art does is it asks questions. And uh, I think it was E.E. E. Cummings who said, uh, always the beautiful answer, where are the beautiful questions? Um, where are the beautiful questions? And, and um, how do we become comfortable with not knowing the answer, because in, the road to progress is always under construction. Mm -hmm. Like every time we reach a milestone, we have to recognize that we have more road ahead of us to develop than we have behind us. Sometimes there's a roadblock. 
and sometimes there's a roadblock. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do, so that's a, a lot of what I'm interested in with language and with ideas and with the collaborations is to just put things in people's minds, in my mind, that kind of um, infect <laughs> us with curiosity. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a billboard, like, so someone else saw that we were doing long signs with Four Freedoms, and then someone, another artist approached the lawn signs from a very different way of, of asking people to write, I feel free. Um, and this kind of open container of being Four Freedoms that um, is, is, is really, hopefully, as expansive as the human mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, really powerful. And these images um, that have been flashing, especially some of the ones of, of young people, um, not only make me reflect upon the session earlier with the two young women that was so, so powerful uh, this morning. But also, um, it made me think about you and this particular moment in your life. You're the father to a new, beautiful baby girl. And I wanted to ask, how has this new responsibility changed the way you think about the work that you do and sort of the imperative that's inherent in the work that you do, what you need to do, what needs to get out there, how, you know, how quickly you might need to get work out there, and the power of the message that you want your work to have for your daughter's future. Well, we named our daughter Zenzele, um, which means in, in De Bele. Um, y it can be read many ways, but it's like you, 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 you did it for yourself, mm -hmm. uh, but it could also be read as you did it to yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I, I gave her that, we gave her that name, call her Zenzi, because we want her to recognize that she has her own uh, capacity within herself to make um, the world how she wants it to be. And, and uh, Zenzile is the name of Miriam Makeba, who is also a major uh, inspiration for us. And what I think a lot about, as far as my role, in, 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 is um, patriarchy and being you know, a cisgendered, heteronormative, you know, man. Mm -hmm. um, how do I not put too much of my own inherited baggage on her, you know, or them, frankly, mm -hmm. to like allow them to be the person they want to be without um, the need to kind of check anyone else's boxes to feel loved. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, if the greatest gift that any of us is given is our consciousness and our ability to say I am, saying I am lovable, which mm -hmm. is something that my grandmother had me say from two years old, mm -hmm. um, is the kind of affirmation that um, can drive you through all kinds of storms. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that, that's, and then also um, for her not to feel that she has to uh, choose a side or check a box, like that I, I say us is them, and they are us, mm -hmm. that we, um, those people over there who I don't want to be like probably just don't want to be like me as much as I don't want to be like them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I'm hoping that um, I can just set an example of, that my, my mother and my father did of uh, recognizing that love overrules, that love for yourself can kind of uh, break many rules mm -hmm. and, and love for your community can open countless doors. And, and so these are our versions of the Four Freedoms images um, that show, you know, real families uh, that have come, traveled across country borders and religious borders to come together um, and are making America great again um, through their love. Beautiful. I think we're going to end it there, yeah? Okay, thank All you. Right. Thank you so much.